Okay, so uh, first question is, um, would you provide a brief autobiographical, autobiographical description of your career in education technology? Uh, gee, um, okay. <laughs> Yeah, where do exactly. I where do I start? Uh, really, you know, I started as an English history teacher, so I, I wasn't uh, interested in it at all. Uh, I remember taking an undergraduate course with Len Proctor back in the day when I did my B. Ed, and that was all hypercard and that sort of stuff, and I could care less about it. But really, I uh, I started off wanting to teach English history. I ended up in the uh, Ended up in the classroom, and there was no availability for that when I started in my first school. So I taught everything but, and the very first, uh, well, and and it was mostly, uh, they 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 were looking for someone who could teach computer science, and the only thing I had going for me was uh, I had an Apple II C, which I had since about grade eight, so it would have been I don't know six ten years old by then. That's all I had. Uh, the first time I ever used Windows three point one. And uh, so that year I taught uh, computer science, well, computers, that would have been in 94. So the internet just came out, really, as you know, as we know it, Mosaic. Yeah. Um, might not have been Netscape then. And uh, then I, by that year, I actually, without ever teaching computer science before, I learned computer science, taught as a sessional uh, for the off-campus division uh, with uh, U of S. So I, I was teaching... CS, I taught everything from COBOL to Java to, uh, I don't know, PHP and absolutely everything under the sun. Did a lot of video stuff. Uh, so I worked on reserve for a while doing that. I taught with SIAS. I did, I was the ICT coordinator for SIAS and SIT um, and taught in a management program with their computer applications, teaching Word and all that stuff, plus the computer science uh, network systems. I did a, at some point I did my CNE, which is Nobel, a Nobel certification, so kind of the technical stuff. Uh, but really, um, oh, at some point I, I, I um, saw an ad, advertisement uh, for the U of R, I think that was 99, and I came here, it was for the ICT coordinator, and somehow I got this job. Uh, I didn't have my master's at the time. I was still um, in my undergraduate, but in a master's program. Mm -hmm. And I finished my master's during this position, which has been really good to me. Uh, now I teach courses, uh, undergraduate courses to pre-service teachers. And I teach uh, grad courses in uh, mostly social, uh, using social software. Um, Social software for the uh, for teaching and learning, I guess, for undergraduate courses or for uh, K to twelve. Um, what else? I don't know. I've been all over the place, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but most I mean, the last eight years, the real gist of my experience has been here. So I've right. been here quite a, quite a while. But mostly undergraduate teacher education, um, some graduate. And uh, a lot of everything in between. So I don't know if that really helps, but uh, I've been really interested in social software, open source, and uh, educational media and critical media literacy. Right. Um, tell us a bit about your, your role um, uh, of the, at the Saskatchewan uh, Instructional Development and Research Unit. Um, well, that's, that's mostly a research um, role. But uh, what I'm doing there is uh, we've, we've been coming up to a lot of technology-related research pro uh, projects. So there's a lot of school divisions right now that are really having trouble with their with the technology uh, skills of their teachers, and and really, you know, that's been a, an issue for many many years. So really, it's about getting research projects, and I happen to find the ones that are mostly technology-related. So one of the ones I'm doing recently is uh, something called the Digital Internship Project. So I'm heading that, whereas we're taking a bunch of interns, putting them in the field, but we're giving them all laptops. We give them specialized workshops. We've created a, uh, a Ning community, so they have kind of a, sort of a Facebook-ish connection. Um, and we're supporting that, them that way. So that's one of the big projects that we're doing out of SIDRU. 
And uh, so I'm, and I'm also doing a lot of PD with uh, school divisions coming in, helping them, you know, their math teachers or general teachers uh, learn the pedagogy of, of the digital way, I guess. Good. Um, so that's that's mostly the Sidru stuff. Yeah. Uh, the next question Richard had here was, where did you study? You, you covered that a little bit. Um, yeah, I did uh, my undergraduate and my master's at the U of S, and I did my PhD here at the U of R. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. And a lot of technical training in between. Um, the next one was, uh, please describe your professional activities and, and uh, uh, professional activities and professional in education technology. Um, I'd ask you specifically about some of the research that I know you're you're interested in, including the open source stuff, and, and if you could tell me a bit about that. Um, well, my dissertation was on uh, the open movement, really, not just open source software, but also open content. So I, I, I'm a strong believer in copyleft and creative commons, um, and I'm also very big into democratic media, so blogging, wikis, um, mix, uh, mashups, remixes, uh, all that sort of media-related uh, uh, media, uh, media, media d democracy-related media, uh, democratic media. So that's one of the biggest things I'm really into is the idea that we should be able to be uh, open, social, and connected and sharing our resources. So that's, that's really the number one thrust in my life. Um, so the particular study I did as my dissertation was uh, looking at teachers over a couple of years and uh, looking at their attitudes and kind of posing or um, comparing those attitudes with sort of the typical teacher. So out of that, I came up to a couple diagrams, for instance, uh, you know, sort of the traditional teacher who's not genuinely connected to a number of others outside. And then there's the connected teacher who's connected through blogging, wikis, social networks, through uh, a number of media, YouTube, whatever else but also who is not just uh, focusing on the consumption of curriculum and, you know, the regurgitation, but also in the, uh, the actual remixing and sharing uh, of media. I think that's one of the biggest things with a connected teacher. They tend to share more. Right. And just, just the idea of collaboration is really tough. In the academy or the university, it's even tougher because a lot of traditional professors have, built their careers on on their intellectual property like they are so strongly associated with this is what i taught yeah. this course is mine this belongs to me and there's not much of a in some ways there's not much of a difference in k-12 to there's a bit more room to leverage because there's just the idea of what you own as an academic is different but really that uh, certainly reflects in k-12 to as well so there's only at that time it was hard to find um, looking back four or five years ago, hard to find a lot of people who are really into the open source stuff. And it, an open source is just the ideology behind all of this, with all this stuff that's happening right now, the, the way the kids are on YouTube sharing. Um, I mean, I just saw the other day there's a Hockey Night in Canada mashup where you can go and uh, pick the highlights and basically mash them up. Nine Inch Nails released an album a few years ago that was in garage band format. Um, you know, Beastie Boys have removed, released their riff, you know, almost everything from their albums yeah. and to encourage you to actually mix these things and, and, and put them together and uh, a whole, the whole idea of sharing alike, you know, share alike, bring it back to the community, see what you can do with it. And it produces a buzz around these artists and it produces a buzz around the, the original content creator. Lessig did... Um, you know, wrote the book code, then he put, he wanted to do a revision, so he put code 2 out on the web in a wiki form, and then he was able to take that, create a whole new re revised book, and then he sold it in Amazon format where people could buy it, and then plus the uh, Creative Commons format where they could, you know, download it for free. The whole the whole shape of knowledge and, and intellectual property is just is changing so quickly. Uh, but what, what do you think is the thing that's that's holding that back the most, or or that's uh, wh what's the thing you come up against uh, in that? Um, I'll show you the book that I'm reading. Well, one of the books I'm reading right now. It's uh, <clears throat> if you can see this, Starfish yeah. and the Spider. Uh -huh. uh, it's by uh, Brafham and Beckstrom. Starfish and the Spider. Basically, it, it actually starts off really nicely with. Uh, talk about um, it starts with Napster and how Napster 
kind of moved into Kazaa, and then Kazaa moved into LimeWire, and then BearShare, and kind of like down the road. And as each of these models went down, they become increasingly decentralized. There was always something central about them until you get into something like BitTorrent, um, Emule, and, and that sort of thing. And so, like even uh, Kazaa, there was a centralized advertising model with them. And it looks at how decentralized organizations have really uh, had success throughout the years. And they talk uh, about a number of traditional uh, models as well. But the old industries and the old models of productions and consumption just trying to hold on to something that doesn't exist. Had, had the big companies uh, embraced a Napster-like model, none of this would have been happening. Like If they would have just said, okay, something huge has changed. We need to do something about this right now. But they're continuing to hold on to digital rights management. Um, schools are the same way. We have in Australia, there's a kid known as the porn cracker. They put in this huge uh, filtering software across all of the schools in Australia. This kid cra- hacked it in 30 minutes. And, you know, it was multi-millions of dollars that basically is, are wasted because there's no point holding this down. You can't. The iPhone was cracked by a 17-year-old. Um, the, you know, the, the DVD code, HD DVD, all that stuff has been hacked all by youth. And there's no point in holding on to this control. So it's the idea of, of relinquishing control and uh, looking at new models and how to exploit these. And those, those people that are accessible, and those, those companies that are su- successful today, minus a few, are starting to see that. Um, Apple still hasn't got it right. They're still locking down the iPhone like crazy. Um, and that's going to be the death of them uh, in the end. Um, I sold my Apple stock. <laughs> I don't know. I just can't deal with them anymore. I've made my money several times over them. and, and uh, But they... They get so close to perfection, and they just can't do it right philosophically. Uh, anyway, that's so. I think it's it's the old models continuing to um, be there, whereas the new, you know, there's there's got to be, but I think there's got to be that tension. Even if you look at copyleft, copyleft in itself wouldn't could not exist without copyright because you need that particular model for copyleft to exist to have all rights reserved or to have some rights reserved you have to have the notion of all rights reserved because it's all based on the rights that you give up uh or the the rights that you uh you reserve as well so um so in some ways it's an okay at least you can see the the difference between it but uh, there's a number of books on on open source economies and so on that are really that are really useful uh i was just watching something with guy kawasaki the other day and he was talking about how many stupid ideas make money these days? And nowadays, you don't have to spend two million dollars to make uh, to make uh, to create a stupid product. You can do it for twenty five thousand yeah. um, bucks. And some of these, and he was talking about his his company is uh, Trumers, which is sort of like rumors, and they did, you know summer rumors and summer you know sort of a stupid idea. And he and he kind of went down the list you know youtube if anyone would have said we want to give you money to do this everyone would have thought this is ridiculous you know uh ebay didn't make any sense at the time like all these kind of stupid ideas are are the big ones google like how are you going to make money as a search engine back then but all of these made huge money but now you don't have to put two million bucks into it you can put twenty five thousand bucks in um and you can you know this and, and make some decent stuff because of the um, because of things like open source and, and all these tools that are on the back end, uh, low cost hardware, all this stuff is happening. So it's it's an inter- interesting world that we live in, though. Right. Um, who is the most? Uh, who was, or or maybe who is now the most influential uh, uh, educational technologist in your career, and why? Well, it goes right back to Rick Schwier, actually. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't be in this place right now if it wasn't for Rick. Rick's always been a mentor me, to me, and uh, uh, I mean, he, he, it's not so much about his, well, obviously he's incredibly knowledgeable. I've seen his list of articles, and I, do, I would have to live three lifetimes to, to print as much as he's done and to publish as much, and it's, it's embarrassing sometimes when I look at mine, so I have, honestly have to live another 40 years. Um, he's done amazing things, and more than anything, he's an awesome guy. 
and an amazing teacher. And he's won awards. He won the 3M award a while back, and he was one of the most observing people I've ever seen for an award like that. So uh, his style, his knowledge, his personality, it's been number one. And I think that's really important as a teacher. And like seeing someone like Rick, I can just basically uh, – know what I want to look, you know, what I want to do in the future. I mean, he's the guy that puts me, I uh, kind of inspires me every day. In terms of knowledge, there's a number of other people that uh, are also inspirational to me. Um, Lawrence Lessig is one of the big guys, and he's the, the guy who formed the Creative Commons. Uh, I can go back to Richard Stallman, who's one of the open source founders. Um, I, I think he's he's a big influence. His ideas, I think, are really important. Michael Geist is an important guy. He's a, a guy. He's at I think the U of T now, but uh, he's kind of the Canadian Lessig, and uh, guys like that I think are are with with the big ideas. I think are really important. So I like them for and they're not exactly like Lessig's a lawyer, but it's that's not the important part. It's it's the idea that's more important than being an ed tech or being a teacher or whatever else. So. Um, could you describe your relationship with, like, I guess, I don't know if you know any of these other uh, uh, people you mentioned uh, on a personal level, but, but the next question was, could you describe your relationship with that person um, as well as the way in which that person shaped your thinking and practice? I'll talk about Rick then in that way. I mean, I can come down to his office any single time and just drop in and, and you know, Rick, I've got to talk to you about this and or can you give me some advice on this? And I always leave... Uh, with so much more knowledge and uh, way, uh, so many more questions as well, but it helps shape my thinking. But one of, the, one of the bigger things I think that I've learned in all of this is that all the people I used to read, uh, I think it was my first PhD class, and this doesn't quite get to your question, but I think it's an important thing, um, is about the, is the humanness in the, and the, the personal that we forget about when we read these people. Um, I've got, uh, I'm teaching a course right now and I've got some of the biggest names in educational technology and it's as simple as emailing these people and saying, hey, this is who I am, uh, I'd love you to speak to the class and how friendly some of these ed tech people are and, and how willing they are to give up their time and do these things. The first time I, I my very first paper I wrote in my PhD program, um, I was supposed to find an article and uh, and basically uh, critique it. So I looked at it for a little while, and I noticed it was from a guy named Rick Kenny, which I know Rick Schweer knows quite well. Uh, and he was, I think, the editor of CJLT, which is one of our journals, um, one of the technology journals. And so I just emailed Rick, and I said, uh, Rick, I found an article from you for years ago. I never even knew the guy before. And I said, uh, how would you critique your article if you wrote it again today? And that was my first stab at, you know, find, finding an author or, you know, all these authors that were sort of so distant when you're, when a, a master's student or an undergrad, like, wow, I'm reading this person. And anyone who wrote an article is sort of a, a foreign thing to me. But that first email and him getting back to me and, and giving me a huge list of how he's thinking differently made me think that every one of these people, Stephen Downs and, and Lessig and, you know, Bernie Dodge, I don't know, any, anyone I can possibly think of. I'm looking at my Skype list. Like, most of these people are my Skype list. I can just Skype them up, and, and they're that close. So all the people that are influences are just a click away. And it's, it's, they're not these mysterious people that, uh, and I think that's what the net does for you. And I think that's one of the most important things is these are real people uh, with great ideas, but when you talk to them, you're actually engaging in great conversations that have been going on for years and years, and they're that accessible. And I think that's the greatest thing that can possibly happen with EdTech, the greatest realization that we are that close to every single human on this planet. I think that's, uh, I think that's the thing I've learned from all of this. And since then, since I've embraced the network and I've embraced this, um, I'm not shy to call someone up. I've never been denied. I've never had someone say, I can't believe you're calling me. Um, Mark Warshower, he's uh, he does something. Uh, he talks a lot about the digital divide. Um, my colleague was uh, teaching a course with him, and I said, 
like we're taking his book and I said, why don't we just ask him to blog for us? And so he came in and blogged on our, you know, our, he's at the University of California, Irvine, and he just decided to be our guest blogger. And the students just, you know, I can't believe this guy who wrote this book is involved in this class so closely that we can ask him questions. Right. But getting over that makes a huge difference. That's so. great. Yeah. Um, what do you think are the two biggest burning issues in, in ed tech today? Uh, control is number one. Um, just because I think people need too much control over, or, or they think they can control this. Um, and I think with that, I'll put power and control that there's this notion that you can actually control what you're doing. The other, and I guess that comes down to like filters and DRM, a lot of this stuff. Um, and the other one probably is the, is, is the, um, lack of understanding that it's not about the tools, that it's really about the pedagogy. And the, the, the tools just enable the pedagogy. But the worst thing I hate hearing all the time is people will say, and I'm, I'm not quite negating myself, but I'm trying to explain it in a different way. Uh, people will say, well, it's just a tool. But it's more than that because it influences everything that we do. So if you, if you negate the power of a tool, you have to understand like what McLuhan said was the tool shapes us and we shape the tools, or sorry, we shape the tools and the tool shapes us. The influence that it has toward us, the, I think they talk about technology uh, instrumentalism versus technology determinism, that we can use it as a tool, that sort of instrumentalism, whereas determinism is it actually uh, takes us with it, you know, it takes us beyond something. So bringing in things like Facebook and bringing in things like uh, Twitter and blogging, um, it really shapes the way we, we have to think about pedagogy. And I think that's one of the biggest things is people don't quite understand that it's just, it's not just tools, it's, it's actually how the tools will shape pedagogy. What, what potential, what can you do in a classroom now uh, in Snow Lake, Manitoba that you couldn't do before and how does that change your pedagogy? So I think that's one of the biggest issues. So I guess number one was people thinking that they can control any of this, that we can put it back in the box and it'll go away. The other thing is not understanding the power of this to change everything. Like, it absolutely changes everything. Do, do you think that, um, you know, with the, in the last even five years, you know, the, the massive new uh, social networking tools that have, that have come out, do you think that's um, changed uh, the way... Uh, change the way that uh, pedagogy is 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 thought of, and and you know, and or should should it have? I well, I think it does, but I don't think it's happening. And you know, we have to understand as ed techs, we're still very much on the fringe with everything we do. And the teachers I see that are using it are certainly the exception. So yes, for those people who are actually embracing embracing it, it it is changing pedagogy. It is changing the way they teach. And teachers today actually have better opportunities for personal learning. And that's one of the biggest things. They can actually learn from the network in a number of ways that they couldn't do it before. But we always have to go back to this is we're talking five, ten percent of the population if we're lucky. And so for this to actually sort of seep into the rest of it, most of them aren't changing. Like none of this is happening. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why. Well, I don't want to change. I don't got the time. Um, I don't, you know, what's the point of all this? It's just technology. We don't have the money. I don't have the control. We have the power. You know, it kind of continues to go on, and there's always excuses for it. But it's sort of like, even on the Internet, they talk about once you've seen something, you can't unsee it, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. And once you feel the power, you could never, I could never go back to teaching the way I used to teach. Once you get to this point, when you, when you feel the power of the network, um, every single session I do, and I was mentioning Twitter to you before, I walk into the classroom and I l write a letter to my twi Twitters uh, on Twitter and I say um, something like, hi, we're in Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, you know, give us some love, let us know where you're from, and I'll get 20, 30, 40 uh, responses like right away from places all over the world. And the students are just amazed, but that's my network. I take them everywhere with me. They're portable. And who's ever, you know, I can say, I need to have some advice about this. Or uh, a student has a question about this. 
that's one of the biggest changes too. When they talk about know how knowledge and know what knowledge, uh, it used to be we ha we knew what to do, but now it's more important we knew how to find it. Like I have Google tip of the tongue syndrome all the time. Uh, like I feel my brain slipping in terms of how much knowledge I can carry versus how mo how I can find them. And I have this like my wife will call me some like ask me something. Because I'll put my computer away and I'll say, you know, we'll have a conversation. And then she'll ask me a question that she knows will just kind of egg me on. I just have to go run to my computer to Google the thing. Uh, and I might have known that in the past, but I don't anymore. But I know how to get to it. Um, I, I carry my iPod Touch, you know, everywhere I go. It's got, it's got Safari on it. Um, it's got my mail. Uh, but being too far from it. So I don't know if it's an addiction, but... It's an extension of who I am, so that's uh, that's what kind of goes back to personal learning, um, and it's a bit robotic, I guess, in a way that we have to have these attachments. But uh, it's my personal learning network. Um, what are you? What are your perspective thought thoughts solutions? Can you provide then to those to those two burning issues? I mean, if if uh, if if teachers aren't embracing the technology, if if we're still if uh, if the technology is growing at such a pace and the adaptation of that technology isn't growing at the same pace, what can be done? Um, you know what, I think, well, for the first point I said, the whole idea of giving up control, mm -hmm. thinking that we can control this, we've just basically got to say, no, we can't control this. Uh, it comes down to filtering things, for instance. I'm going to speak to a group of administrators in a couple of school divisions here. And administrators want to hear that, they want to hear support for filtering and they want to hear support for security and all that stuff. And I, and I support security, obviously, but I don't support any filtering. I think things need to be wide open because kids aren't going to learn about this stuff anywhere else. Um, if you noticed, one of the big uh, viral videos is known as Two Girls, One Cup. I don't know if you heard about that. Anyway, so it's all over the place. You have grandmothers reacting to it. You've got kids at all ages reacting to this. That's viral. So obviously it's, you know, it's a disgusting video, but if, you know, kids all talk about this. I asked my undergrads, okay, how many people know what this is? And there's, you know, giggles and laughs and everyone knew what this thing was. Um, and for them to know that I know makes a difference, I think, because you can actually bring up some of these issues. Now, I don't know where you're going to do that with elementary kids, because, but, but they may already be exposed to some of the stuff. But you're never going to hide this stuff. So that part of the control is, uh, we talk about, I don't really like the term dig digital citizenship, but it's the best term I have right now. But I do like talking about the, the term integrity, because I think integrity is something that you can have across a number of circumstances. So how you act in the real world is a way you should act online, but we don't talk about that. We just sort of block out our online experiences and we forget about that. So in, in schools, we really have to deal with that. So giving up control and actually educating kids about these things and what it means to be responsible uh, on the internet, uh, I think is really important in the, in the global connected world. And now I think the other question was, let me think, I forget. Uh, uh, my the, other, other, the other one was uh, just the, the adaptation, the, the, the fact that teachers aren't necessarily embracing the oh. new technology. Well, and, and they always won't. And, and, I think, and I think teachers are exhausted. There's, it's not just technology integration. They're, you know, they've got new things coming down the pipe all the time. And I think we have to leave them alone a bit. Uh, I mean, honestly, it's some of the stuff that comes through is garbage. Or, and, we, and we continue, you know, it's ridiculous. And then we move from one thing because we've changed our Department of Education and, and there's someone that has something that they could have put down the pipe. Um, one thing that's remained constant, there's a number of things. Kids need to learn. Kids learn better by, uh, you know, constructing. That, you know, these things haven't changed. And one of the ways that we can actually construct well with opportunities that we haven't done before is using technology. Um, there, there's basic things about learning. If we look just basically at what learning is and how we can mediate the best learning possible, that's how we get to teachers. We don't have to deal with all the, lim uh, the, the you know, all the lingo and so on. 
Um, and I think there's always going to be resistance, and I don't see that as a bad thing. Resistance is good. Um, the other book I'm reading is down the road is um, uh, uh, The Importance of Dissent, or I can't remember the actual title, but dissent is good. I mean, it's good to have people in society because if we didn't have any dissent, we wouldn't be doing this. I, I consider what I do revolutionary in the sense that I'm different than most of my colleagues. I'm different than, you know, and I try to push these ideas in schools. But if I, I probably wouldn't want to do this if 90% of the people liked what I did or agreed with what I did. It wouldn't be nearly as fun. You know, preaching to the converted is just not very fun. So I think, and I'd probably, I'd probably take a polar, uh, you know, I'd be the other 10% again. I hate technology. I'd be a Luddite all of a sudden. Just for the, you know, but I believe in this, and I think it's really important that way. What are you most in, enthusiastic about uh, in your field that, that's coming up? I mean, it, looking into the future of, of ed tech, what are you most enthusiastic about happening? Um, you know, we're sort of in a, we, we've seen all the social stuff I think we're going to see for a little while. I think the next big thing is going to be robotics, honestly. Uh, we're going to get into robotics, and not so not the robotics that we see in the sci-fi picks, but like like I mentioned here, the, the extension of oneself, I think, is going to be really, really important. So personal learning networks, I think that's where we're going to go. Things that are actually extensions of ourselves. The uh, cheap hardware, uh, I talked, or, or the, the person who's left, her, I think her last name was Jepson, who left the OLPC project, you know, with that one laptop, one laptop yeah. per child. Yeah. She left. She was sort of the creator of some of the tech, the key technologies. And uh, now she's talking about starting a new company. And she thinks that they could, within a couple of years, they can create uh, a $75 laptop. So what does a $75 laptop mean, you know, to to schools? I mean, to, to you know, to have that accessibility. I think the hardware question changes a lot of things. So... And in terms of robotics, in terms of uh, hardware accessibility, those are the big things. And that will enable all of the other things that we're doing because right now we don't have the technology, we don't have the software. I think those are uh, some big things. The things I'm worried about right now, though, are uh, net neutrality is going to be an issue. You know, what uh, Rogers and Bell and Sastel or whoever else can do down the road because they want to stop from the technical level, who's sharing what and so on and what that's going to mean. Um, those sort of things actually stopping all of our fun. I don't know. That that, that could happen. Um, and anything around the uh, digital millennium copyright, um, there's been some, they're trying to make some revisions to make us even more restrictive than the U.S. in terms of what we can do, what we can rip, what we can share, what we can do. And I think that has huge implications for um for, for us for, and for education. Huge implications. What do you enjoy, enjoy most about your work? Connections, definitely. Uh, you know, some days I don't want to leave work. Well, I'm still at work. <laughs> I went to the gym today. I work 16, 17, 18 hours a day some days uh, and probably seven days a week. I absolutely love it. It's uh, The connections are so much fun. It's... Uh, being part of the network and learning and then being able to take my learning to my students is just a riot. It's, it's so good. Um, and it's become so much part of my experience. Like, I don't know who I'd be if I wasn't learning all the time, if I wasn't trying new things. I, I'm pretty, and I'm pretty spoiled here because I can get the gadgets I want and I can get the software I need and so on. So I'm, I'm good that way, but they're getting a lot out of me too. So it's, uh, it's not that bad. I've got my, quad or dual quad core machine here with 16 gigs of ram and you know like i, I wouldn't have that normally so it's uh, i can do a, a lot of things here with that but it's uh, like i said they're getting a lot out of me but i love it like this is just so enjoyable i mean the old saying that you know uh do what you love for the rest of your life would never work a day you know that sort of thing yeah 